I'm very happy for your study and to speak about orbit equivalence cost or got dimension now too many numbers too. Yes, uh, thank you. So today, uh, it's uh, uh, the L2 betting numbers day. Okay. Um, first of all, yesterday, some of you noticed that uh, in the examples I gave uh, concerning the cost, uh, it seems that the cost equals one minus the Euler characteristic. Okay, because for instance, for a free group, Fn, the Euler characteristic, um, it means n minus one, minus n minus one. Okay, and uh, the cost of every action, so the cost, the infinitum, as well as the supreme cost of the free group on n generators uh, equal, uh, well, n, which is, yes, one minus the other characteristic. That's true that uh, on uh, most of the examples I gave, probably all, or most of the examples I gave, uh, the formula was uh, correct, but, if you take, for instance, let's say F3 times F3, the direct product, product of two free groups of rank three, the other characteristic is plus four. And you see that then we are in trouble if we consider one minus uh, four, which is minus three, and the cost is defined as, uh, well, it's always a positive number. And uh, moreover, I told you that it is greater than one when the group is infinite, okay? So this formula cannot be, uh, so this is true, but uh, this is true too. <laughs> yeah, I did not write anything wrong. Okay, anyway, I can tell you that indeed, this formula uh, cost of gamma, the infinite cost, equals one minus the other characteristic of gamma holds when the group gamma is variable. And of course, when the other characteristic is defined, is defined, which is not always the case. I mean, you need some finiteness properties for your group to admit um, other characteristic. Okay, anyway, we will come back on that. And by the way, so we saw that this group uh, puts us in trouble with this formula, but uh, also it leads to the question whether, so we saw that three groups of different rank cannot be orbit equivalent, while they are measure equivalent, okay? Uh, there are lattices uh, in the same uh, group, for instance, in F2, okay, or in SL2R. Anyway, what is the equivalence class, or what, what can we say about, let's say, F3 times F3? So, the trick I explained to you about permitting generators implies that this has cost one and fixed price one, okay? So all its free PNP probability measure preserving actions don't have a cost one. It is not an angle group, so the cost cannot be realized. It is not trivial, okay? So we cannot put a true structure varying measurably on well, the orbits of some of any uh, free probability measure preserving action of such a group. That's okay, you remember this kind of uh, stuff? Okay, so what can we say about F3 times F3 say and three copies of F3? So they have just one, both of them. They are uh, non-trueable, 
for the same reason, okay? Are they orbit equivalent? Are they measure equivalent? It's not clear so far. And uh, the answer is no, because of the L2 Betty numbers. Okay? Uh, because the L2 Betty numbers, the vanishing of the L2 Betty numbers is something that is remembered by measure equivalence. Okay? And this group has L2 Betty numbers equal to zero, zero, four, then zero, zero, zero. And this one, you have, well, not only it's, uh, so you have zero, zero, one more zero, and then another zero, and then zeros, okay? So the place where they do not vanish uh, are not the same. Okay. So, um, so I remind you that uh, very quickly, maybe, okay. So it's a kind of a complement of what I said yesterday. So measure equivalence, I told you, I remind you, you have a measure space, which is not a probability space, but it has a measure, which is invariant under commuting actions of gamma one and gamma two. And these actions preserve part of the measure, so, and have uh, a sum and have a sum on that domain of finite measure. Okay, and if you divide out by gamma one and let gamma two act, the actions you get are SOE, stably orbit equivalent. I will now give you the definition of SOE. So we have two actions, gamma one acting on X1 mu and gamma two acting on X2 mu two. They are said to be orbit stably orbit equivalent if you can find inside x1 some subset y1 that is a complete section i remind you this means that it meets all the orbits okay so y1 meets the gamma 1 orbits for a set of measure zero maybe same thing that meets almost all the gamma two orbits. And in the isomorphism, the ball isomorphism between y1 and y2, that sends the measure to the measure. Of course, if you, uh, uh, so we have x1, y1, that meets all the orbits. And let's say x2, y2, that meets all the orbits. So I want an isomorphism between these spaces. Well, it's easy to realize that all are borel isomorphic to the interval zero one. But what about the measure? So it says the measure mu one normalized here, okay, to the measure mu two normalized here, okay? So it scales the measure. That's clear? You wonder why you want to meet every orbit exactly one? Second. Yeah, this is, you know, I remind you, the first amendment, you are not allowed, if, if your groups are infinite, you cannot do that. So at least once, here, these actions are PMP, both probability measure preserving, right? And the fact is that if you have a major equivalent, uh, I mean, a coupling between gamma one and gamma two, if you divide by gamma two and let gamma one out, you get something like that, up to rescaling the measure to make it a probability measure, something for the other side. And I claim, and uh, what uh, Mathieu explained you yesterday is the first step to understand uh, that mutual equivalence is the same thing as SOE. Yeah, that orbits are sent to oh, Yes, of course. I was so excited with the, with the measure that, so it's F 
this isomorphism. Sends, uh, well, let's say, the equivalence relation associated with the action of alpha one restricted to y one uh, is the equivalence relation of alpha two restricted to y two. Okay. Thank you, Anush. No question? Okay. What about the cost with this uh, relation? The measure equivalence is an equivalence relation between groups. So you can classify groups up to measure equivalence. Uh, just to let you know, there are uncountably many uh, amenable groups. So the classes, uh, some classes are uh, uncountable. And then uh, it follows that for three groups, the same old. You have uncountably many groups measure equivalent to the free group. Take free products of amenable groups. Okay. So what about the cost? In this situation, oh, I can write it here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here, the cost of alpha one minus one divided by the measure of mu one equals the cost of R alpha two minus one divided by the measure of mu two of uh, y two. So this is the induction formula, induction formula for the cost. Okay. And so now mm, Excuse me? Where does this follow from? This, this equality? Where does it come from? Where does it follow from? Yeah, basically, how do you prove this? Why? I cannot prove that. It's a theorem. I, I, I mean, it's in my paper <laughs> on the cost. If uh, this is a question, holds uh, for stable orbit equivalent actions, yeah? This is for stable orbit equivalent actions. And if you are orbit equivalent, this means that you can do that with y1 and y2, essentially equal to x1 and x2, which means measure one here and there. And so the costs are the same. Okay. What's nice about it, for example, you could choose y1 and y2 in another way, yeah? Like you could have this partialized amorphism, it doesn't have to be unique. So, absolutely. Yeah. If you can choose y2 uh, in two different manners with two different manners, this implies this will imply that the cost equals one. This is a good remark. And behind that, there is a, a, a group, a subgroup of R plus star called the fundamental group by Morel von Neumann, which is the scaling, the self scaling auto similarities. Of your equivalence relations. For them, it was for the following man algebras, but um, this is a very much connected, related. Okay. Good. Now, <clears throat> ultimate numbers. So, for every group gamma countable, countable group gamma, nowadays we can also define ultimate numbers for locally compact second countable groups. But it's uh, really, it's, uh, it's another matter. Also, the cost can be defined for locally compact second countable uh, group. And this is also uh, a deep subject, very hot. And uh, this is uh, what uh, Sam I discussed here and yesterday. And um, so Amanda uh, did with, uh, or, are doing, in fact, uh, together with uh, Nikolai Franchik. So, costs for locally compact second countable groups. Okay. Anyway, if gamma is a countable group, you can associate to it a sequence of numbers. It's L2 between numbers. Ah, yet another one, and I stop here. You got the, the idea. It's an infinite sequence with uh, degrees 
one, two, three, corresponding to dimensions. Let me write and to Betty Mingus. Okay. Um, so you may know, you probably know that usually Betty numbers refer to rank or dimension of some homology. Okay. And here it's the same, just that this L2 means that you will consider Hilbert spaces. And then the dimension is not the usual rank or dimension or a vector space, but it is the Feynman dimension of some homology space, which is a Hilbert space together with an action of gamma. Okay, this makes sense. I, I'll try to explain you. And uh, <laughs> okay, good. So this, uh, I should mention some names. So first of all, Attila introduced uh, in 1976, uh, uh, two beta numbers for some, uh, for some particular cases when the group is the fundamental group of a manifold which is compact and a spherical. You know, the universal cover is contractible. Okay? And uh, so it's, it is very analytical. It uses uh, the heat kernel on the manifold and so on. But the general definition for every countable group is due to Chigar and Gromov. 86. <laughs> so, uh, so, defining the ultimate number, so you now believe me that exists. And uh, I will uh, motivate. Um, maybe with what precedes uh, by a theorem of mine, uh, it is that if gamma one and gamma two are stably orbit equivalent, distance, then this formula holds for L2 beta numbers. So if gamma one S O E gamma two and let's choose one particular f. Okay. Then, so I, I need I mean I mean y one and y two. So for every degree g beta g two of gamma one equals beta g two of gamma two when we scale on my measure of y1, measure of y2. Okay. So, in particular, if my groups admit an orbit equivalent action, then all the two beta numbers must be the same. Okay. If they are just S or E, they must be proportional. So, uh, Projectively, the sequence of L2 beta numbers are the same. Okay? So, if you remember, so this explains why these two groups are not measure equivalent. Okay? <clears throat> Good. So what is the beginning of your sentence? I said if the measure equivalent. Yes. Yes. Okay, I should have a little here that we want the actions to be free, and both of them. When you take this measure equivalence coupling, it is not clear that the quotients are give free actions. But this can be solved very easily by just multiplying by a Bernoulli shift, if you want. Are we aware of group whose Betty number sequence are proportional, but they're not stable orbit equivalent? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. For instance, uh, for S and C, Z, all the L2 Betty numbers are zero, the same as Z itself. 
One is amenable, the other one is very far away from being amenable since it is, in fact, a cardan group. Okay, an infinite cardan card group. Okay, one more question. Uh, uh, so, indeed, what I did in order to prove that, I defined the notion of L2 vector numbers for equivalent relations. I'm sure I won't have enough time to define that. But for every P and P equivalent relation, there is a well defined notion of L2 vector numbers. I hope I will give you some ideas how one can do it. Okay. And the point is that if your equivalence relation is given by a free PNP action of gamma, then the alternative numbers of the relation agree with those of gamma. Okay? So equals beta j two of gamma uh, if r equals r alpha or three PNP action. Alpha. This makes sense. Okay. Good. Now, mm -hmm. good. Oh, yes. Slides. So I will share screen to show you a list of L2 beta numbers. So don't worry. You don't have to write this right away. I posted on my web page a vademecum about that. Okay. And so if you go to my uh, home page and in uh, the papers, one of them, maybe the seventh or so, is called uh, around, let me see. it's something around the orbit equivalence theory measure equivalence. You click there. And it opens a page, and there you have lecture notes that cover part of what I told I, I lecture here, and a Vadimikum that I just posted today. Okay, so it contains this and a little bit more. Okay, so in particular, you see that if, G, if, if gamma is generated by G elements, then the first n 2 beta number is bounded by G minus 1. If your group is finite, then all its LGBT numbers are zero, except the zeros, which is one over the cardinal. And this should remember something, uh, ring a bell with uh, the cost of finite groups and uh, that we saw yesterday. If the group is infinite amenable, then all its LGBT numbers are zero. This is originally due to and Kromov in their paper, in their 86 paper, but you can also prove it using this and Einstein Weiss theorem. You know that every infinite amenable group is orbit equivalent with Z. And with Z, for Z, it's very easy to, to check. For three groups, everything is zero except in degree one. For surface groups, and maybe uh, Mathieu will, this is an exercise using the next slides. Uh, for lattices, uh, so the numbers have the tendency uh, of being zero, okay. except often in one place. So for uh, lattices like this, it's uh, if it is not zero, it is in the middle dimension of the associated symmetric space. Okay. For direct products. You have the QNET formula, we will see it. Uh, so you can say that all the alternative numbers of such a product are zero, except in degree R, the number of uh, factors you have. Okay. Now, if you take a free product, then, okay, I will show you uh, the, in fact, it was the first slide. Okay, anyway. In this case, the alternative numbers are zero, then A. Minus one plus one plus one, blah, blah, blah. We will see it. So K in this place. And then non zero, possibly because you have this product. And then zero everywhere. So you can arrange with free product, direct products, and so on. You can produce your own 
uh, ultimate numbers. So uh, here you have the connect formula. So once you know the ultimate numbers for some groups, you can produce new uh, ultimate numbers. Uh, you have the Poincaré duality formula. If your group is the fundamental group of a closed aspherical manifold, then the symmetric degrees do have the same ultimate numbers, the top and the zero, uh, top minus one and one and first and so on and so on. Okay. Uh, for free products, so there is a difference between degree one and degree zero, and degree and higher degrees. So in higher degrees, it's very simple; it they just add up. But uh, in degree one, it's essentially this is because the trivial group has zero first alternating number, which is equal to one, and this is the reason why you have this one here. And if these groups are finite, then you have to subtract one over their cardinal. Okay, so with that, you can compute many L2 T numbers. And tells you that if you have a finite index subgroup, then the L2 T numbers are proportional. Okay, so this is a wonderful news that L2 T numbers are proportional when you take finite index. This is not at all true for usual. Betty numbers. So, in this sense, they are better. Okay? And they give you the uh, Euler characteristic also. So, the Euler characteristic, you know, it's a form group that admits a compact uh, classifying space. So, you take the Euler characteristic, the, num the alternative sum of the number of cells in each degree. Okay? Uh, it is indeed in a variant of the group. Which agrees with the alternative sub of the Betty numbers uh, in the sense of L2. And due to point R, it is also the case that it is the alternative sum of the Betty numbers, the usual Betty numbers of K. This is why the name Poincare is here. All Euler Poincare introduces the Betty alternative, the alternative sum of Betty numbers and Attila for the L2 stuff. Okay, so in general, it has been proven by a trigger Gromov also. Okay. So let's let's go. So uh, first, an open problem. Go for the problem session. Uh, the so-called uh, cost versus first and two number question. So uh, does there exist a group gamma such that the cost of gamma is different from, so this is always greater than, let's say, cost minus one, is it uh, different, so strictly greater than beta one of gamma minus, uh, one of the cardinal. So usually we have this inequality, and it is quite conjectured that indeed we have equality. Yes? Yeah. What we see over there. Yes, the can we get back to the board? Oh, yeah. So, can you spotlight the board again? Ah, okay. Because so, I have to, oh, to okay. stop the sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. oh, okay. That's it. Oh, yeah. Very good. Okay. <laughs> so, why, why is that? Is it my fault? No, yes, probably. So, I leave the meeting. No, it's not enough. The don't think the beauty is that it's not of course. Okay, so now let's go. Um, 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 um. Okay. So we start with we start with uh, an action of gamma. Now it's 
not the measured stuff. How do we compute betting numbers first of groups? Okay, so we consider gamma acting on some simplicial complex L. So L is a simplicial complex. So each cell is determined by its uh, vertices, right? And the option is free and co compact. So uh, with uh, that, so. Okay. You have more white. Yes. We will use the group very soon. But if you have just L, you can consider the space of chains. Cn of L is, let me put K, is the set of formal sums. So chains are just modules or vector spaces. It's the space generated by cells of degree n okay yeah why does such an l exist come on you can just take uh, uh, l to be gamma itself i mean one point <laughs> if i don't ask l to be connected or simply connected or so there is no no problem but uh, this is a good point we will uh, reach that Soon, if you want L to be uh, simply connected and co compact, this implies that your group is finitely generated. So, if you want some conditions, some topological condition on L, you need some conditions on uh, the group itself. Okay. So, it's the formal uh, sums AI sigma I, where sigma I or n simplices uh, and ai belong to a. So here, so it can be z, it can be two, the reals or c. It could also be a finite field, but okay. Uh, let's uh, stick to this family of. Uh, of algebraic objects. And so you know that uh, so you know that associated to that you have the boundary. So the boundary of uh, one edge to the edge oriented. I could cheat a little bit with uh, the definition, but okay. So if you have one edge, sigma, and uh, with uh, I don't know, coefficients uh, coefficient seven. The boundary of this is this endpoint with coefficient plus seven and that endpoint with coefficient minus seven. If you have a cell like that with a coefficient, I don't know, three, then the boundary and orientation like that, then the boundary is the sum of this edges, each one with coefficient three. Okay, so you have the boundary max. And this defines what is called the chain complex. So CN, L, uh, I will forget the K, huh? C, N minus one, K, blah, 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 C, one, uh, L, sorry, C, zero, L, and it says zero. Okay, and uh, the homology, so, Point is that if you take the boundary of a boundary, if you compose twice, you get zero. Okay, so this means that the image of one map is contained in the kernel of the next one. And the homology measures exactly the defect of the kernel to be equal to the image. Okay, so yeah, D. Composed with d equals zero. Okay. And uh, so maybe I write this here. Okay. 
of your homology, this can continue, is the kernel of dn divided by the image of dn plus one. Okay, and uh, if this is a vector space, this is a vector space. If this is a Z module, this is a Z module. Okay, and uh, this is, so for instance, for K equals Z, this is an abelian group. If uh, L was itself compact, this would be, uh, well, this is too long. I won't enter that. So this is the usual homology. Uh, I guess most of you already know that. Maybe not all of you, I don't know. Okay, so now uh, we can observe that L is connected. So connected, it has no topology of two dimension. So the, it is connected, it is simply connected, which is which means that the fundamental group is uh, trivial. The second homotopal group is trivial, and so on, up to dimension n. Okay, then what you obtain here does not depend on the particular choice of L. But just on the group gamma. So if your group gamma, oh sorry, oh, let's assume L is n connected, so you got the definition H n of L not gamma. Okay, so it is n, n connected, which means that it is connected, simply connected. By Euler's theorem, it means also that all its homology groups are also zero, as defined here, up to a degree n. Now you let your group act. It is co-compact. So now you, you have a compact space, and you have introduced some uh, topology. Of course, the fundamental group of this, for instance, is gamma. OK? So now this space has some homology. Since it is compact, so let's say it is isomorphic to if it is real to the, to the BN, which is a better number of this quotient. This makes sense? Okay, and now is a theorem that or proposition of theorem. If so in this situation when L is and connected, the invariance you get here, uh, this is independent. So if you take L prime with the same property, the co-compact, you get the same group of homology, the same spaces of homology. This makes sense? Now let's switch to L2. Uh, so, yeah. so, so far we consider other finite chains like that, but now we will consider L2 chains. So instead of saying that, okay, the simplices form a base of our algebraic set of chains, let's say that they form a invert base. Okay, so C n now with a two here of L, this is the set of formal combinations a i sigma i such that the sum of the module of a i square are bounded. Okay. So uh Observe that since we have an action of gamma on L, which is three, co compact, now you can choose one point per orbit. The commandments allow that, okay? You choose one point per orbit, and then you can identify that orbit with gamma, since the action is free. So you have finitely many copies of gamma in each degree. By this, I mean that. 
this in that space is indeed the same as a direct sum of a finite number of copies of L2 of gamma. Is it clear? Okay, you pick in each orbit one point, then the orbit identifies with gamma. Okay, so each of this sigma i then named G, an element of the group, applied to one element of the fundamental domain. Okay, and so, since you take L2 formal uh, combinations of them, copies of L2 of gamma. This makes sense? Direct sum is potentially continuous. Okay. A lot. Of no, no, no. You have finitely many. You have only finitely many orbits. The action is co-compact. Is it for n equals zero? Sorry. For every n, the action is co-compact. And just so, the quotient is compact, right? Uh, sorry, the action is co-compact. Yes, the quotient is compact. So you have finitely many orbits in each dimension. Okay, so. The, Alpha n is the number of orbits. How many cells do you have in gamma, in L with gamma? In dimension n, we have finitely many cells. Oh, Which means that upstairs you have finitely many orbits. Okay, and this is the number of n cells in the quotient with alpha n. This makes sense? Okay. Good. Now, um, this uh, chain, this ugly chain here. I will write it again here. C N two of L. C N two uh, minus one. And so R is C one two L C zero N zero. So the boundary operators, because of the concomitantness, extend operators between these Hilbert spaces to continuous linear maps between the Hilbert spaces. Okay? So, so now, the homology for L in degree N, this is just the kernel of the N, this extended the N, modulo the image, of the n minus one, right? But of that, we are dealing with uh, Hilbert spaces, okay? And uh, when we divide, uh, the image of a continuous map is not necessarily closed. So if you take this quotient, this could be very ugly, right? And this is why indeed you take the corner of the image, and then you add a small bar here. And this is the reduced L2 homology, homology space, if you want, in degree. Okay, good. Now, that is the nature of this uh, space. Okay, it is the quotient of a input space by a closed subspace. This is also a input space. We have forgotten the action of gamma. Gamma acts on each space of things chains. By just permitting you, you, you have the left action of gamma on L2 of gamma, corresponding to the action of gamma on L. It acts by moving the cells. Okay? If you take the boundary, boundary image, or you take the image, then the boundary, it's commutes. Okay, so the boundary operators commute with the action of gamma and, uh, and so the parallel is gamma invariant, the image is gamma invariant, the closure of the image is gamma invariant. So we have here an action of gamma. I mean, gamma as a representation onto this Hilbert space. Okay, this is a gamma module. And he did the Hilbert gamma module. Okay. And I will now introduce the notion of dimension for that. Okay, but the dimension, of course, a Hilbert space has every dimension 
zero or finite dimension or uncountable. Okay, and uh, uh, in this situation, it is rarely, it is, it is never finite, except when the group is finite, okay, or it is zero. Excuse me? It's not exactly that. It, it is indeed the mode of the Sengen man algebra of gamma. I don't want to enter into this, but uh, we can discuss this later on if you want. Okay. I just I would like to arrive at the matter of dimension. Okay. So first of all, uh, observe that this inverse spaces admit joint spaces. Okay, which are the space of maps from cells from uh, the field to the base field. These op op operators admit a joint operators. Okay, so associated to that, you have the co chains, the co boundaries, and so on. Okay, and this is uh, what you observe the following. Let's consider CN. L and uh, a stupid uh, decomposition as the kernel of DN plus the orthogonal of the kernel. Okay. Now observe that inside here we said we have the image of DN minus DN plus one. This is contained in the kernel. Okay, so it has inside the kernel. An ortho complement. So, plus something inside the kernel. This something is denoted like that with the curly H. Okay? Plus, or as this orthogonal of the kernel. Okay? So, this is called the space of. Harmonic two chains, uh, sorry, n chains, space of n two harmonic n chains. Okay. Now remember, when you have a map between two inverse spaces and you take the joint, uh, the orthogonal of the kernel is the closure of the image. Of the other one. So this is indeed the image of DN bar. So, star. Okay? And the same here, you can replace this by the kernel of DN plus one star orthogonal for that. Okay? Which means that the rest. Is indeed the kernel. So this is the kernel of the n plus one star. Okay, this makes sense. Okay, now realize we are after the quotient of this by that. This is naturally isomorphic to this offer complement. Okay, here you have an action of gamma, an action of gamma, an action of gamma. So you have a gamma invariant space. Which is gamma equality isomorphic to the quotients we are after. Okay, so I can add here H and U is isomorphic to that in a gamma equivalent way. Okay, and moreover, you see that H and two is indeed the intersection of the n plus one star with the kernel of DN. And all of that, I leave you as an exercise to show that indeed this space is the kernel of the Laplace operator in degree well N. This operator delta N is just delta N plus one, delta N plus one star, plus delta n star delta n. Okay, using this, you can show that quite easily. Okay, so now, we, where are we? 
we have a space which is a gamma Hilbert space. Okay, Hilbert space with a gamma action. And this is what we are interested in, the homology up to this isomorphism, right? And it is a subspace of that, which is a sum, a finite sum of L2 of gamma. Everything is gamma invariant, okay? So this space, which and the space of harmonic chains, is a closed subspace of that. And it is gamma invariant. Do you follow me? Okay. Now I will define the dimension of such a thing. Okay. So how do you do to define uh, in a parametric way the dimension in uh, uh, linear algebra? You saw uh, the dimension of a subspace. You are in, say, Rn, and you have a subspace V. You take a projection to V and you consider the trace. Okay? The trace is the dimension of Z. Yeah, we do the same thing. More or less. So, first of all, I will explain you the situation when V is a subset, is a subspace of L2 of gamma, just one copy. Okay? And V uh, is closed. And gamma invariant. Right? Okay, you take the projection from LP of gamma to V, the orthogonal projection. Okay? So I remind you that this means that P equals P square equals P star. Okay? And I claim that P commutes with gamma. Okay, gamma acts by left multiplication here. Yeah. I claim that this P onto an invariant subspace commutes with gamma. Well, this is very easy indeed. You, you see, you take a vector, a vector in the space, you project it, you make gamma act, then you reproject. The last projection is stupid. Okay, so this is the same as gamma. Now you take the joint of this formula. P star, which is P. Gamma star, P star, which is. And now here you have P and gamma star. And this holds for every gamma, in particular for gamma inverse. Gamma star is just gamma inverse acting. So you also have that for every gamma. And thus it commits. Okay. Now, the place. So imagine. So you have a favorite, favorite drop base given by uh, I mean the characteristic function of one element. This is a, imagine you put your, your projection, you look at it as a matrix, a huge matrix, of course. So that is a general element. So it is one of G scalar product. One of H. This is what you have at the end of uh, GH, right? Okay. And now you are after the diagonal stuff. So what do you have on the diagonal? You have one G, scala, one G. And you want to take the sum of that. It will be infinite in general. Why? <laughs> The best reason is, you see, the characteristic function of G is just the image of the characteristic function of the identity by G. You just translate this. The same here. So G, one of E. But now, this and that commute. And this is a unitary representation. So this is G, P, one of E. G one of E. Okay? And this is the same as P one of E, scalar one of E. All the diagonal elements are the same. Okay? And the trick, which is the 
Pavlov's key trick and the Murray trick is to take one of these values as a trace. So you define the trace of E as you pick one, so just E, one of E, scalar one of E. Okay? And this is the definition of the dimension of V relative to gamma. This is the choice of P of V. And you can observe that the choice, so it is a choice means that if you, if you take any operator on the two of gamma, but you can mix, but you can mix with you can do the same trick and define the trace. The trace is defined on the whole semi algebra of the group. All the operators that you commit with gamma. Okay? And in general, if you have V inside several copies, then the, you can decompose into blocks first. Each block belongs to the fundamental algebra, so commutes, and you, you have a trace. Okay? And it is not difficult to check that it deserves, deserves the, the name of trace because trace of ST equals a trace of TS. If you have two operators that do commute with the group. Okay? And so now the L2 uh, numbers of the action of gamma on L are exactly defined as the gamma dimension of the space of harmonic chains. The trace of the projection, the orthogonal projection from CN to L to uh, this closed invariant subspace. I don't have to tell you that this is impossible to compute. Okay. This quite such a projection express exactly what is H is impossible. But of course, we, will, uh, we, we have, uh, by chance, we have many formulas. So for instance, so what is the notion of the, 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 the properties of the dimension? You see the dimension, so for instance, here, uh, of L2 by itself, the dimension is one. The dimension is zero, is zero if I mean if the space is zero. And the key point is that it satisfies the rank nullity theorem. Okay? So, in particular, or I, I have to, something to add, but okay. Uh, the rank nullity theorem is the following. So, if you have V1 and V2 that are two subspaces of sums of L2 of gamma, and actually many of them, and you have a continuous gamma equivalent map between them. Then we have a gamma dimension here, or gamma dimension there, and for the image and for the kernel. And it is dimension of the kernel of F plus dimension of the image of F. Of course, you take the closure equals the gamma dimension of V1. You have the rank nullity theorem, and with that, you can make the first computations. And then use QNET formula, use uh, the Maya Vitori stuff. And uh, you can show abstractly the point array duality. So you can compute L2 beta numbers of more and more groups. It has been also related to the L2 forms by Borel. So you can compute, oh, okay. Yeah. But here, the point that is missing is. If L is L connected, then the L2 beta numbers you get here do not depend on L. They are invariants of gamma, and they are the L2 beta numbers of gamma. So let me uh, let me finish very quickly. But just look to define the usual homology of a group. You take L, which has no topology, with a C action of gamma. The no topology means, means no homology in particular. You take the quotient to produce homology. This is the homology of the group. Here, what we do, we start upstairs, we have the group acting, but instead of passing to the quotient, 
and now a little bit the chains. So we get something from the infinite. And then afterwards, we divide by gamma in computing this dimension. Okay. The point also is that if you have a finite index subgroup, the dimension is just multiplied. The finite index subgroup acts on L2 of gamma. Okay. Its dimension is exactly the index. Okay. And so just to show you that something appears, let me consider the tree of balance C4 on which F2 acts. If you consider any chain, so this has H1 and H0 equals zero, right? Ah, a zero bar, let's say. Anyway, this is zero. Okay. Uh, so you have C1 of T, C0 of T. And the homology groups are trivial, right? At least here. Okay, why? If you want to have something in the kernel of this, so it's a chain, it has some values on the edges. If you have a finite sum, you have boundaries. And these, I mean, the, the, the external, external points will receive some mass when you take the derivative. So the kernel is trivial, period. Now, if you pass to L2, I will construct a chain. So here I put one on this edge and the one third on each outgoing edge. So that when you compute here, you get zero. One plus three times one third. Then one over nine. One over nine. And so on. And you continue. You can check that this is L2. Okay, and what is the total uh, derivative of that? It gives you here one minus one. Okay, and you play the same game, adding one third, one nine, one over nine, and so on. And I produced an element that is in this space and in the kernel. Suddenly something appeared from the infinite. And uh, if you want to compute the ultimate numbers, how many? Cells, how many orbits of edges do you have? The rank of the group here is two. Okay, but in general, it's the rank of the group it is Fn or Fr, let's say. R. So the dimension of that, this is isomorphic to R copies of L2 of Fr. This makes sense. It's from another dimension, is R. What is the dimension of that? You have one orbit of. Of vertices, one. So, rank unity theorem. Well, it's not difficult to show that this is onto. This is dense. I mean, the image is dense. Essentially, what we proved here, we obtain this vertex before adding this third, one third on that side. So this one, the boundary gives you one here. So you generate. All, the, all the, the, the elements of the Hilbert base there. Okay, so the rank unity theorem tells you that the kernel plus the dimension of the image equals the dimension of the initial, which means that the kernel has dimension R minus one. The first L to the T number of FR equals R minus one. You computed your first. <laughs> number. Maybe it's time to stop here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? I think we need to stop. Yes. All right, let's say that. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions for Don? Um, way back at like the start of the talk, and we were talking about. If you don't mind, this has nothing to do with dynamics. This is about the um, the state of orbit equivalence. If you so, I would mention that if you took a second, um, y two and u two, and it was stable orbit equivalent to the first guy, we said that the cost was one from the first thing, um, or something like that, right? Yes. Right. Um, yeah. So you said that you uh, have two times the second y two. Is there like a canonical one that you might want to pick sometimes? 
Um, I can, I can. Okay. The same thing appears here with a two vector number. Oh, yes, I, I forgot maybe to, to mention that this uh, theory with uh, SOE, MU, and so on implies that if you have two lattices with the same locally compact second countable groups, then the empty numbers are proportional with respect to the R measure of the of the core volume. Okay, and this is a general result, uh, a general consequence of uh, this theory of empty numbers for equivalence relations and so on. <clears throat> and you see also that in order to compute the empty numbers, of course, if your group admits a very nice L of dimension D that is contractible, then the activity numbers above dimension D are zero. And maybe we have guessed that for activity numbers of equivalence relations, you try to put spaces instead of just graphs, spaces of higher dimension, you compute the things, blah, blah, blah. If you can find a space where all the connected components are contractible, then above the dimension, the activity number must be zero. In that case, if your group is trueable, the empty numbers must be zero above dimension two, starting from dimension two. Okay. And since the ultimate numbers, and you take the alternative sum, you get the, the earlier characteristic. This justify the observation of uh, some of you yesterday. Right. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Damien again.